they expected me to dance there, they were sorely mistaken. So <laughs> I do love the, the the standing gallery in the back here. Um, I, I re refer to that as the Gallagher Gallery. We've got a whole group of guys back there standing there on their phones. Um, all right, you guys ready to rock? Um, what's going to happen here is we're going to talk about connections and. I'm probably going to go at about Mach 4, because they only give me 18 minutes, and I'm probably going to stay about 30,000 feet. Um, my goal is not to delve in deeply onto any uh, specific part of this for two reasons. Number one, I can't hit them all, but number two, and probably more importantly, you're hearing so much of the detail from the other speakers. The speaking, uh, all the different speakers are weaving their presentations together, and that wasn't planned, it's just kind of working out that way. So I don't have to go into a lot of the details because you're already getting the details. All right. Big green button. Who can tell me who this gentleman is? Anybody? Who in this room is over the age of 50? Raise your hand. Who in this room who's over the age of 50 had a TV in your home growing up? Raise your hand. Y'all have no excuse. <laughs> Nobody? Jeremy's yeah. name is James Burke. James Burke is a British television commentator and historian. And back in the late 70s, early 80s, he had a, a show on BBC called Connections, ironically. Um, great show. If you haven't seen it, YouTube it. It's awesome. But what James Burke would do week after week, episode after episode, is he would take some modern convenience or invention that we can't live without, call, make the microwave oven. And he would go back in time to ancient history in most cases and start with an event that led to another event, that led to another event, that so-and-so met so-and-so, that led to another event, that led to an invention, that led to this. And he would draw this direct connection between you know, a, a horse in a farmer's field in 700 AD throwing a shoe to the microwave oven. And he would make those connections and it would make sense. It was fascinating, and every week it was a different, a different invention or something. So I like that as an example of what we're doing. Everything we do is interconnected to everything else we do. Things that we do that we might not think have any bearing on other things in our industry and in our business and our culture have bearing. And so I want us to all be aware of that first of all. Uh, I tend to think visually, and so I put this graphic together more for my benefit than yours. Uh, it's just to show at a very high level, how the connections in our lives are interwoven. Um, you as the employer are connected to customers, to the culture, to the funeral home or cemetery you work for, to the, to the community, and vice versa. Those connections um, are far deeper than that, and there's much more detail, but I have to kind of put it in perspective for myself, and then I can, I can narrow in on certain parts of it. So let's start with some easy ones. And easy ones, I say that because most of you in this room are salespeople or have been salespeople. First of all, everybody in this industry is a salesperson. Um, even the guy in the back of it is a salesperson. But this is a group of salespeople at a sales conference. And you have been hearing awesome advice and given lots of tools today, and you'll get even more tomorrow, um, on how to do that job well. So this is kind of the tactical end of things. But let's talk about that for a second. What types of things do you as a salesperson employ when you're meeting with a family? You're, you're building rapport. You're using body language, empathy. Um, how you talk, that you're not using dirty language. And thank you, by the way, for that picture of the live boy in the kid's mouth. Now that's stuck in my brain. Um, all those things are helping you as a salesperson build a certain level of trust and credibility with the customer and opening the customer's mind to what you're sharing with them. Okay, you're opening the customer's mind to the message you're giving them and ultimately to the sale. So that's fairly straightforward. Now how do you as an employee connect with either your company or the community or both? We tend not to think about this quite as much and we don't think it's as directly connected to our performance as salespeople or our company's performance, but I would posit that it is. It's just harder to see. You can connect with the community in a lot of ways. Get out there and volunteer. If you're not, do. Give up your time, talent, treasures. Do it in a, in a public way. Not, not for your own aggrandizement, not so you can pat yourself on the back, but when you're out there, you're flying your company's flag, guys. You're building trust in that community and, and confidence that you, as an employee, and then your company, by proxy, is invested in the community. With your company, 
I love some of the ideas I've heard about connecting with like others in your company, funeral directors, if you're a cemetery consultant or if you're an advanced planning insurance consultant, maybe with the cemetery. Um, make those connections, get to know those people, learn to trust them and help them to trust you, number one. But beyond that, become an expert in your company. It's goods and services. The value statements that you need to, to utilize to talk about your company. The differentiators between your company and the competition, those are vital to know. You need to be an expert. And beyond that, I think if you're going to connect to your company, this is a little radical, I think you need to be a customer of your company. If you're trying to convince someone to purchase pre need funeral insurance, and they're giving you some pushback saying, yeah, but you know, we don't know where we're going to live when we retire. We might move to Florida. And you're trying to help them see the value of it even though they might move to Florida. And they look at you and they say, that's fine, Chris, but have you purchased your pre funeral pre planning insurance? And you haven't? You think you lost a little trust and credibility? Okay, same thing with the cemetery. You haven't bought your cemetery space? Why? Do you believe in your company and the value of the product you're selling? Yes or no? So, a lot of people don't want to talk about that, but I encourage all my staff, we give a heck of a discount. <laughs> Become customers of our company. How about the company to the community? First of all, I kind of mentioned you as an individual can connect to the community by giving your time, talent, treasures. The company needs to do that. You business leaders and owners out here, some of you are resistant to this, and I respect that, I get it, but I think you're missing the boat. You're missing the long-term boat. You might be looking at the bottom line and saying there's no ROI on that. I would challenge you in the long term, there's not only an ROI, but it's called survival. If you're not invested in your community and out there in the community in a visible way supporting the right causes, causes that support your values, then I think you're missing a huge opportunity. And in our business, above all others, trust and reputation is king. You also need to, to certainly have the scope of products and resources that your customers are demanding and needing, and that the cultural trends are dictating you have. And I've heard some of that already today. And absolutely, if you're in a high cremation rate area and you don't have much cremation product if you're in a cemetery, you might want to remedy that. But, but is throwing a cremation garden in or putting up a, a niche columbarium, is that enough to be relevant to your community and your customer? I think we use the term relevant a lot. I use it a lot because I'm always seeking relevance for our business. But is that enough? I don't think it is. I think it's necessary to be relevant. It's necessary to have the scope of products to be relevant, but that doesn't make you relevant. I think true relevance is a little bit more nebulous, but you have to work on getting them, first of all, into your park to know. I might have the widest array of products in the world and everything they'd ever want, but if they never darken the doors of my cemetery, what does it matter? Am I relevant? No. So, so we need to get them in. They need to listen to us. But beyond that, when they come in, they have to fall in love with what I have. And I, I, I'm turning that, I'm just making this, this up at this point, but my way of thinking about this is, is that's resonance. I, I have to be relevant and give them what they need and want and answer their questions and solve their problems, but I need to do it in a way that resonates with them. When they walk into my park, when they walk into my urn garden, do they go, oh, I love this, I get it. This feels like home, it's local. And so we're all about, in our design at the cemetery, all about being relevant, but resonating with our customers. In Albuquerque, New Mexico, it's all Santa Fe style architecture. And, and Santa Fe style architecture is cool because it's very traditional uh, Spanish style architecture intermixed with a lot of abstract weirdness. I've got colored glass popping out of these traditional adobe walls. It works in Santa Fe and Albuquerque, but it would not work in Cincinnati, Ohio. But what works in Cincinnati, Ohio, and what would be resonant there, doesn't resonate in Albuquerque. So you've actually got to give some thought to your location and your customer base and what you're doing. Okay, they have to pay attention, I mentioned that. So about five years ago, we changed marketing firms and we used a marketing firm called McKee Wall Work and they're brilliant. Um, and they totally revolutionized what we do. And we went a different way. Now, no offense to all of you, I'm not quite like Gary Freitag where I'm trying to take you all off. But the reality is most of your advertising sucks, okay? Ours did too. It all looks the same. It all has the same imagery, the same messages, has way too much text, and no one pays attention to it. The only people that pay attention to your advertising, if it's that kind of what I consider traditional style, are your existing customers. They're the only ones that pay attention to it, but they're already your customers. Isn't the purpose to draw new customers? So we went a totally different way, very modern, very clean, 
lots of white space, and we weren't too prescriptive. We didn't say too much in it. We made them work at it. This was the first billboard that went up. Yodo. Who can tell me what that is? You only died once. Okay, I'm 52 right now. This was five years ago. I had to ask my then teenage kids, kids, what does this mean? Because I didn't know. Okay, they knew instantly. Well, you only live once as YOLO, so this must be you only die once. Like, oh, I got it. The deal is, I had, to, I had to ask. I had to mull it over in my head. We had people driving by that billboard weeks before they figured it out. And then they had this light bulb on going on saying, oh, that's what French was trying to do. They were trying to get me to think about it and talk about it at the dinner table all the time. And it worked. So much so that the very first day it went up, there was a television news reporter who was at her gym. She was on her treadmill working out, and all she heard around her was conversations of people talking about this crazy billboard that French put up out on I-25. She went out and took a look at it. She immediately went over and interviewed our, our CEO, Tom Antrim, and we got a ton of free press and publicity on the news that night, just because we put up a billboard. Now, we also had a lot of complaints. Oh, we had people complain. We are being disrespectful, and, and this, is, this is a sacred thing. You, you shouldn't be lighthearted and joking about funeral. Every billboard we put up since has some of those complaints. But what's the key in those complaints? They're paying attention. Here's another series of billboards we put up each summer. We, we first need to present them with the problem that they might not know they have. So we're doing that. If you read some of these, one in five people live with their loved one's remains. So the implied problem that we're telling them they have is you likely have cremated remains at home, and that's maybe not the best place for them. We're trying to address the issue that we're all facing. It's our big bugaboo right now, which is how do we increase our capture rate and memorialization of the park of cremated remains because they're walking out the door. Next one, parks are better than closets. That's all it says. <laughs> Guess what? The implied message there is, if you got them at home, that's not the best place. You need to get them to the park. Third, last wishes don't include eternity in a basement. I like that one. Uh, you know, Great Aunt Maud probably didn't want to end up in your basement forever, so maybe we ought to think about doing something with it. And then lastly, we gave you the answer. Scatter day. What the heck is scatter day? Just as a date and then scatter day, people just talked about it, talked about it, kept asking questions, and they were calling us, what is scatter day? That's the whole idea. They called. Scatter day was our solution to the problem of no fire resting place for cremated remains. Once again, this is our marketing firm came up with this idea. The issue is this, if they're taking them home and they're never darkening through the door of the cemetery and I'm losing all connection to them, how can I get them back in? Well, so maybe cost is an issue. Maybe they don't know what's there. Maybe they just don't think there's an opportunity. Give it away. So we said, okay, we'll give it away. Once a year, we have scatter day. We give to anybody in the community that has cremated remains at home, pet or human, by the way. Come on in. We will give you the option of two or three different places to scatter them within our cemetery, and we have three or four different options of where you can memorialize in stone permanently, all for free, no charge. First year, we had 400 families show up, about 1,000 people, but 400 sets of free men remains. The next year, there was over 200. Now think about this for a minute. This didn't cost me much at all. It really didn't. Now I have 600 in two years, 600 families who I have a connection with, their names are in my system, they have legacy and they have a body at my cemetery. If dad was on the mantelpiece for 10 years at home, mom dies next year, they're not going to take her home for 10 years. They're bringing her right to the cemetery because that's where dad is. And it got them into the cemetery. And in showing them their free options, I got them on a grand tour of the park. And they saw all kinds of things that they'd never seen before and didn't know a cemetery had regarding cremation and memorialization. And many, many, many of them said, I like that. What's a colored glass? Can I have that instead? Sure, we'll apply the free value of this to that straight across. Not a problem. So a lot of people upgraded. And we asked every one of those 600 families, why did you have those remains at home? And you know what? The cost was rarely the issue, maybe 5% of the time. I wasn't ready to let go of them. It was rarely the issue, maybe 5 or 10% of the time. So our assumptions are wrong, typically. 80, 85% of those people said either directly or some close variant of, I didn't know what to do with it. Thank you so much for providing me with a solution. It was awesome. We're going to do scattered every year. <laughs> Another thing we need to do more of as an organization, and you all need to do more of this organization, is starting to get out into the community. Instead of trying just to get them into the community, 
Some of you do great events in your, in your, uh, in your parks, especially. Some of you have more real estate to do that with, and I envy you. Uh, we do that as well. Uh, one example is a Memorial Day service. We all do Memorial Day services, and every year we had 250 people show up, and then it was 225, and then it was 200. It was the same 200 guys, and they were dying. No one else was coming. And we were competing with every cemetery, every mortuary, every church, and every veterans memorial in the city. Why are we doing that? Or why are we doing it that way? It's very conservative church and service. Classic Memorial Day service. So we said, heck, let's do something different. We went with a Green Army Man theme, okay? Remember the Green Army Man? Uh, once again, you 50 year olds, you should understand this. There's little toys that we all played with. They were very ubiquitous, they're everywhere. I did things in the backyard with Green Army Man that would probably get me arrested now. Uh, but everybody knows the Green Army Man. So we had professional actors dressed in full Green Army Man gear, face paint, arm paint, you name it. Uh, and little hats that they stood on looked like a plastic toys, and they were in the, the classic poses. You had like bazooka guy and minesweeper guy. And they just stood there. We put them out in public, outdoor malls, a civic center. They just stood there. No signage, no explanation, no nothing. Boy, did we get Jeff and Jenner a lot of buzz. The Green Army Man. What are the Green Army Men I've seen all over town? And then we'd move them the next weekend. Then we put up a billboard. Once again, this same style of billboard, and all it had on it was a giant 30-foot, three-dimensional Green Army Man saluting. And then it had a date. That date was Memorial Day, but it didn't say anything. It didn't say, hey, come more service. Just a giant Green Army Man. We had veterans by the score calling us and saying, that is the best, most respectful thing I've ever seen. Thank you. We'll be there. And then at the park that year, instead of a traditional service, we had about three times as many Green Army men in full regalia. We set up an Army field kitchen, and those Green Army men staffed the field kitchen, and they were all mic'd, and they were just talking and telling stories amongst themselves, totally ignoring the crowd. We were peeking in to what was going on in this field kitchen. They were actually peeling potatoes and cracking eggs, too. It was a full setup. And they told stories about veterans. All of those veterans were buried in our park. Real life stories. It was powerful. So we've done that, and very into that each year. And then the last thing we've done um, to get out into the community in a non-threatening, non-funeral way is these silly chalkboards. <laughs> I give some credit to Gail Rubin because she, had, at some point a couple years ago, approached me and said, "I'm doing this Albuquerque Before I Die festival. Will you make me some chalkboards?" Because if you remember the Before I Die chalkboards about ten years ago, it was a worldwide art project, and they were everywhere. So I said, sure, and I made these giant chalkboards out of steel and cedar posts in my garage. They didn't cost much. And we put them out at a uh, community college in New Mexico. And those are the, the three you see there. Those are who were out at CNM, the community college. Within an hour or two, it was solid. You couldn't get more writing on it. We had to erase them every day. So two years now, we've had them out there. We've had them at head events. We've had them uh, at different community events, TEDx talks. These chalkboards have become fundamental to what we do. We've got them all around our park. When one of them gets moved for a service or for repair, I have families in my office complaining, where's my chalkboard? I bought that grave right there because my son just died and I bought it near the chalkboard. Something as silly as that is huge because it allows them to interact with the space and with us in a different way they used to. So we as a business, just to close out, we need to start making connections with people in a different way. Just having the products and services is not enough. Just having skills on sales is not enough. We as organizations need to be thinking in a different way. Because what's happened is we've lost connections to a whole set of generations. The future generations have severed their ties with us. And we have to reestablish those, but we have to do it on their terms, not ours, in non-threatening ways. So I challenge you all to find ways like this to get out in your community, make connections, and reestablish contact with the next generation. Else, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 50 years from now, we will be completely obsolete and out of business, all of us, even if your numbers look good now. Thank you.